So, today may be a little bit shorter. I don't know. I, I put this, uh, this material together yesterday, and I don't know if it's... I don't think it's that great, to be honest with you all. Um, but um, I have three lectures, three lectures left for the rest of the semester. Um, hey, Katie. And um, hey, Abby. And uh, yeah, I honestly didn't really like this chapter when reviewing it. Um, I thought it would be nicer, but our our frontal lobes are connected with everything that we could literally talk about this for an entire semester and I don't want to do that and I never want to do that that sounds awful but and we've talked about the frontal lobe quite a bit the lobe frontal lobes quite a bit um to to connect with other things that we've discussed And so I do want to take the opportunity to throw in a little bit of cognitive control, you know, some specialized stuff that our our frontal lobes do, a prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, uh, lateral, ventral, lateral, prefrontal cortex, all that, all of these these places that we are going to do. Three lectures left, Katarina, yep. Today, Thursday, and next Tuesday. And then we'll do a review on Thursday. Any sort of review, any Q and A, and that's that. That's what we'll do. So we'll we'll still have a stream, but there won't be any new stuff. There won't be any new stuff. So today, Thursday, and action on Tuesday. Okay. Um, and then no class on that last Tuesday of the of the last week of school. Um, so you'll it'll be clear come next week and that's on the schedule as well um so what we're gonna do to start is we are going to listen to it's due the first week of it's due the first week of um may no the last week of april sorry that's why we don't have class that last tuesday of the semester but again it's all on the um it's all in the syllabus. Uh, so we're going to start today by watching uh, What's-His-Face's The Mind series. Philip Zimbardo's The Mind series from the 1990s. We saw a bit of this when we watched um, Clive Waring. Okay, we talked about him for memory a few weeks ago. Um, here is the link because I'm going to have to cut this out from the YouTube video once I start playing it. Uh, because it will be flagged for copyright and it will not be allowed to be um, public unless I remove it because they have a really strong, really, really strong uh, copyright uh, order for this one, copyright infringement order for this one on YouTube for this series. Um, so while it is on YouTube, I still cannot use it in my video on YouTube. Tell me how that makes sense, but that's okay. Uh, so there's the link. Uh, this is the, um, this will get you, just this will get you to the right video. Or you can type in uh, the frontal lobes, cognition and awareness. Uh, it's about a nine minute video, and then we'll jump into what I have to share. Thanks, Julia. I got that email. I'll have to look. I'll look at it after class. Second edition. One of the main reasons I'm playing this is happens, because it's, those mental processes it's talking alive, about stuff that we're not going to go over. When interferes with the normal structure of human thought. In 1983, Bill Mazal graduated in the top 10% of his law school class and passed the bar exam on the first try. 
This time I want you to start with the number 101 and count back by sevens. Today, he seems normal, okay. but in 1984, a stroke changed yeah. his life. 101, 94, 87, 80, 73, 66, 59, 52, 45, 38, 31. One afternoon in January, I got a phone call from Bill to say something was really wrong. It was an emergency. I needed to come home right away. So I went racing home, and uh, I asked him what had happened, and he told me that he had just been sitting on the couch watching TV when he got this blinding pain in his head and uh, felt very sick and could barely make it to the bedroom to collapse. Turned out to be very bad. Turned out to be an aneurysm. And the aneurysm, as I found out, is a blood vessel that balloons out and starts to bleed, which it did in, in Bill's head. And it was right in about the, the frontal lobe area. That's where the bleeding occurred, is in, is in the frontal lobe area. Right. It was very sudden. It was very scary. And neither of us had any idea what was happening to us, what was happening to our lives. Another way to put it is he had future. a hemorrhagic stroke. It may be very hard to appreciate exactly what is wrong with somebody uh, with frontal lobe injury. There have been many studies to try and pinpoint a particular function. And in some ways, it's almost easier to characterize frontal lobe function by saying what it doesn't do. It's not the part of the brain that makes us speak. It's not the part of the brain that allows us to see. It's not the part of the brain that allows us to hear. It's not the part of the brain that allows us to touch something and recognize what that is that we just touched. Uh, it's not really by itself the part of the brain that remembers. Uh, it doesn't seem to be involved in any particularly discrete perceptual, sensory, or so-called motor function. But in spite of that, it seems to have a very critical role in how we use the kind of information that other parts of our brain are dedicated to determining. Before the aneurysm, Bill was very organized. He could plan things sort of automatically. He was very much a planner. He could uh, keep a million details in his head. He had an extremely good memory. He was very outgoing, very self-confident, very take charge kind of a person. Following the aneurysm, like now, Bill is, ex is still very intelligent, but he doesn't have the capacity anymore to apply that. Bill retained after his stroke all of the knowledge that he had previously but he lost his ability to problem solve and in losing his ability to problem solve which is what lawyering is really all about um, he lost his ability to be a functioning lawyer uh, and you know there's nothing more disappointing than finding somebody as bright as he is working with him for a couple of years and then you know seeing overnight those skills just gone uh, you know it I mean it, it really cuts deep when you see that recognize these tinker toys. tinker toys your job is to make whatever you want with them okay get started anytime you want okay because frontal lobe injury causes such subtle problems psychologists like Muriel Lezak have devised clever ways of evaluating the damage in making a construction with Tinker Toys, Bill simply jumped into the task with no plan, no forethought. It had not even occurred to him to have had a goal. Overall, we're talking about the frontal lobe as an executive brain area that is responsible for integrating uh, information that comes from many different brain systems into a purposeful plan of behavior anticipating the future, making critical judgments, being able to survey a situation, to juggle ideas, and to choose which idea is most likely to have implications for the future. Did you have any ideas in your head when you started doing it? Not really. I thought, well, no. I was going to make two separate things and sort of join them together, but just any two of these together aren't real sturdy, and so I thought I'd get them together earlier. Mm -hmm. If thinking is the process of using information to make decisions, then the frontal lobe is crucial for thinking. 
Without that, without the frontal lobes, we are at the mercy of our environment. We respond to events without reflection. We are unable to plan for our futures. It is this capacity, the ability to plan for the future, that distinguishes us from all other species. This rhesus monkey has a relatively well-developed frontal lobe. The idea is to see whether he can remember where the food is after his vision is blocked by the screen, whether for him, out of sight means out of mind. If we did not have the ability to keep information in mind when it is no longer in view, we would be responding on the basis of whatever stimulus attracted our attention. The ability to regulate our behavior by internalized knowledge or internalized memories, that is uh, everything that we can uh, keep in mind, allows us to uh, modulate our behavior and to control the outside environment. The Galago monkey is far more primitive than the rhesus. He finds the food in the left food well the first time it's offered. But without much in the way of a frontal lobe, will he have the capacity to keep the food's location in mind when it's now placed in the right-hand well? The frontal lobe may be the most highly evolved area of the brain, and it seems to be the last area to develop in children. At seven months old, Caitlin's brain is still undergoing profound change. Like all children her age, her frontal lobes function more like those of a Galago than a rhesus. Even the slightest distraction causes her to lose track of the food. It will be years before her frontal lobes are functioning at an adult level. Of course, when we say that the frontal lobe is crucial for thinking, we do not mean that the frontal lobe carries out this process independently of other structures in the brain. It carries out these processes through its connections with other centers, through its connections with the sensory centers where information from the outside world is formed, and with the memory centers where information is stored and with the motor centers where the final decision to act is taken. To think, then, is to activate an entire network of nerve cells that link areas throughout the brain. All right, so, yeah. I think that was pretty good. I think the story um, about the guy in the beginning... Um, was a, a good place to start with all of this um <coughs> excuse me so we are going to jump from there and talk about a few things um, that i think will be relevant uh with the frontal lobes but first i want to talk about oh, no don't play again um, a definition that is offered by the folks at UC Davis, the Translational Cognitive and an Effective Neuroscience Program at UC Davis. So TCAD, uh, TCAN, sorry, TCAN. Um, it's a really good program. I, I knew a couple of people up there uh, doing graduate work uh, with neuroscience and emotions. Uh, and so with with our discussion about emotion last week, I think we talked about that last week. It's, it's all blurring together now. But um, with our discussion on that, an emotional regulation of the limbic system is primarily performed by the frontal lobe. So it makes sense, right? And so cognitive control and all the other things that we are going to talk about today. Cognitive control is the process that allows information processing and behavior to vary adaptively from moment to moment depending on current goals rather than remaining rigid and inflexible. Okay. So it's an adaptive process that keeps you goal oriented. Okay, so whatever goals that you have, it's an adaptive process that's going to keep you directed toward those goals. Okay. 
and the area associated with all of that adaptation and control are the frontal lobes and specifically that's what we're going to talk about today right obviously the name of the class or the title for the class is frontal lobes and cognitive control so what controls the cognitive control right um who watches the watchers well that's I have three major areas that we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about the prefrontal cortex. Okay. The prefrontal cortex is generally speaking. So the entire highlighted area is the frontal lobe. Okay. But the prefrontal cortex is these three, these three areas. Okay. Or what we'll refer to interchangeably with as the, um, uh, well, it's these areas, but I think medial frontal is in there as well. It's three main subdivisions. So I just want to say that the SMA and the PMC are not included in the prefrontal cortex. So we are talking about the lateral prefrontal cortex. So that's on both sides. Okay. It's the dorsal part going ventrally down to about where it hits your temporal lobe. Okay, so this is a large area full of sub areas in the prefrontal cortex. Okay, then we'll talk about the prefront, the frontal pole, which is literally the front of your head into the medial portion. So you can see the frontal pole sits on the lateral and then goes into the medial portions of each lobe. So it's boop and then in. Now I really wish I had Brian. And then the orbital frontal cortex, as well as the medial frontal cortex, are the prefrontal cortex, right? So orbital frontal is right below your eyes, so it's right here. And then the medial portion connects to what we'll talk about in a minute, which is the anterior cingulate, or the cingulate gyrus completely, which is this whole shebang, right? Sitting above the corpus callosum. And as we've talked about all semester, this is my favorite area. And you'll find out why today, or in more detail today. I've told you why today. So the lateral prefrontal cortex is uh, associated with most cognitive control that we that you read in the book. We're not going to talk about all of it. Um, we're barely going to talk about any of it. Short-term memory. Um, and speaking of short-term memory, working memory. Okay, so lateral prefrontal cortex is most active when working with stuff like holding a phone number in your head, um, doing a puzzle, a visual puzzle, for example. Uh, it's the most active. So the lateral portion of the frontal lobes are most active when you do that. So that short-term memory, working memory. Um, inhibition of prepotent responses. Inhibition of prepotent responses. I'll talk about a prepotent response in just a minute. So hang tight on that one. Uh, and then selective attention. So we talked about attention at the very beginning of the semester. And so this is where our spotlight shining. So the lateral prefrontal cortex is responsible for where our spotlight is shining. And it's that's important for cognitive control. If we are not adaptive to what our goals need from moment to moment, then uh, we don't have the attention for that, right? So we need to focus our attention on what our control needs to be, okay? Other things that it's associated with, which are in the notes portion of the slides, if you go and download them, short-term retention, oh, yeah, short retention of information um, that is received from other cortical areas, specifically your auditory cortex and your visual cortex, uh, as well as the what and where pathways for each of those things, okay? Because that tells us, uh, what information we need to work with as working memory, right? Uh, I, behavioral planning. And you saw in the initial image of the guy's brain, it wasn't a very, so this is from the 1990s, it wasn't a very detailed brain. I think it was from, that was from a, uh, a CT, uh, computerized tomography scan of, his, of the aftermath of his stroke. Um, and so it was kind of blurry and stuff. Today, you could get a much better image, of course, uh, 25 plus years later, right? Um, so the stroke showed just about right here was where his, uh, am I, I'm not, not doing it on the right screen. 
uh, just right here on his, on the top of his head, just near the central sulcus, okay, or the, you know, the, the main fissure of your brain, the hemispheric fissure of your brain, just right there, and you can, and, and you saw, and they told you in the video that he could not uh, plan, his planning was shot, and that is counter to his behavior prior to the injury, prior to the brain trauma, that he could plan. He was a very good planner, and he was a very good lawyer, and everything was great. But um, his p planning was was now shot after this uh, experience. Uh, selecting uh, an intended action. So you can see that the prefrontal cortex is connected to the SMA and the, um, the PMC. So selecting what actions those things are going those things are going to generate is very important. Enactment of rules; those rules are uh, important for uh, you know doing the plan that you've set, right? Uh, multiple behavioral goals; so you create an action hierarchy to achieve those goals. Again, more cognitive control. Strategic planning for the development of knowledge. So what you're doing right now. Uh, specifically requires the lateral prefrontal cortex to put things in sort of the way that will most benefit consolidation later, okay, making those connections later. So not only the visual aspects, the the, the um, auditory and verbal aspects, but then how those things connect and then later how they will be consolidated when you are asleep or not, right? You could not encode any of this and then it'll be all gone by the time you go to sleep okay and then event action um event action planning okay now the frontal pole is that front part there from the lateral surface the front the most anterior portion or the rostral portion of the brain through to the medial edge of the lobe, right? So I'm going from the front inward, okay? So frontal poles are essentially this, okay? And so everywhere on my fingers, not my thumbs, just this, okay? If I were to have a brain that protruded from my skull, from my forehead like this, that would be the frontal pole on each side, right? So more cognitive control, okay? Uh, emotion and reward, okay? So it, 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 um, inhibits emotions and engages in reward. Okay. Memory retrieval is seemingly uh, impacted. So that is bringing things back from somewhere in the cortex that's being stored. And then, of course, the hierarchical representation of action goals that, um, and, and it's connected to the um, lateral PFC, so it's important. They have um, lots and lots of connections for that. However, one big thing about the frontal pole is uh, huge. Um, there are issues with artifacts and imaging at the frontal pole because it's at the edge of the imaging space during an MRI scan. The actual imaging of the bold signal can be impacted by non-activity okay so if you have either too much activity or too little activity this doesn't actually reflect pathology it reflects the limitations of the mri the imaging technology which is interesting because we're like yeah fmri is amazing but it, but right at the very front, it sucks. It sucks. And for some reason, it pretty much the frontal pole is the um, only place where artifacts are a major issue. Um, and and it's just the most anterior region, right? It's just right here. So medial portions are fine, but just just right here has several issues with imaging and so pathology shan't be confused with um imaging quality which makes it hard to determine which makes it hard to determine like 
what it is we're actually viewing on a functional scan of somebody's brain with the frontal pole, okay? And then um, the medial prefrontal cortex. So we have um, this here, okay? Hey, look, it's the ACC, y'all. It's the anterior singlet cortex, right? Of the, anti uh, of the cingulate gyrus. So the cingulate gyrus is this whole thing all the way to the back. So this is the cingulate gyrus, okay, front to back, anterior, posterior. Um, and the ACC is the anterior part of that gyrus. So the anterior cingulate, and it's called the cortex because it's part of the cortex, and it seemingly has the same function as the, neur uh, the neurons around it. So that's why it's called the anterior cingulate cortex, right? We're not concerned with this posterior part of the gyrus. That posterior part is um, indicated in other things. I forgot I didn't put my music back on. Let's get music back on. Talking about that interior cingulate cortex. All right. Um, so more cognitive control, obviously. Error detection. This is where we're going to go. And resolving conflict. So the reason, the major reason why, just to reiterate, all throughout the semester, if you want to think of a single thread for, for this class, is the anterior cingulate cortex, Dr. Swan's favorite brain area. And the reason why it's my favorite brain area is because it has to do with what I did for my dissertation, okay? And this idea of error detection and resolving conflict. Um, and so the slides are gonna look a little smidge different because they're actually from my dissertation talk back, um, back in the day, um, several years ago. So. Here we have, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this discussion with you regarding conflict detection by showing you a base rate neglect problem. Uh, base rate neglect is probably something you've seen before and you may have had a class where I talked about it already. So this, in this case, it'll be review, right? So the problem goes, and this is fake, okay? So, but, so this is a fake study um, for people who go in and... Um, and do this. So, a thousand people were tested on in this fake study. Among the participants, we were able to figure out that there were 995 engineers and five lawyers. Okay. Excuse me. Jack is a randomly chosen participant of the study. He's 36 years old. He is not married, and he is somewhat introverted. Right. He likes to spend his free time reading science fiction and writing computer programs. So this has um, interesting diagnostic information about Jack. He is one of 1,000 people from this sample, okay? And you're asked a question, what is most likely? Is Jack an engineer or is Jack a lawyer, okay? And this one's fairly simple, right? He's totally a lawyer. That's the stereotype for lawyer, right? No, he's not a lawyer. This is seemingly stereotypic information for an engineer, right? Somebody who is... Um, not married, has introverted, spend time free reading science fiction, right? He probably builds robots. I don't know. He writes computer programs. He's totally building an AI and he's Johnny Depp from Transcendence and he's going to become a computer program. I don't know. Jack is weird. Maybe, just maybe, he's Caleb from Ex Machina, right? So he's probably an engineer. With that information, you're like, yeah, yeah, he's probably an engineer. Also, the fact that there are 995 engineers in this sample really tells you that eh, Jack is probably an engineer. Now, this is fine. This is called a congruent problem. There's no conflict here whatsoever. There is no conflict in the diagnostic information that's represented by the brackets, although the brackets are a little off. Sorry about that. Um, and the um, base rate information, which is this, 995 engineers and five lawyers. There's no conflict between these two. Conflict's an important word here, okay? Error rates are typically lower than 10%. Now you think, why are people still making errors on this? Well, importantly, you have to actually have stereotypes in your knowledge about engineers in order to determine that this is an engineer. It may have struck you that Jack seemed like just an introverted lawyer. 
if you have no stereotypes about what engineers are like, what engineers do, then you may have guessed a lawyer. Okay, and so that's why their error rates are not zero. Okay, are non-zero numbers. But still very low, less than 10% if you do a series of these non, what we'll call non-conflict problems. So let me make a change. The change I'm gonna make is I'm gonna switch the base rate information. Nothing else about the problem is changed, okay? So I have five engineers and 995 lawyers now, okay? So base rate wise, probabilistically, there are a lot of engineers, okay? Jack is still 36 years old. He's still not married. He's still introverted. He still likes spending his free time reading science fiction and writing computer programs. He still does all of those things the same stereotype is activated in your brain. It's still the same stereotype. And so when you ask people to make the answer that they think is most likely, again, same question, Jack is an engineer, Jack is a lawyer, what is most likely? The idea is that people still use the red bracketed diagnostic information to um, m m give their answer. Their answer is not the normative answer. If I were to set one of these as the correct answer, then their accuracy would be zero. Okay, they would have gotten this wrong. They would have gotten this wrong. So, and, and so that's why it's called a base rate neglect problem. People neglect base rates. Now, do we have base rates in our normal lives available to us? Eh, it depends on what you're talking about. A, a perfect situation here is we do have base rate information for all the things that are going on um, with coronavirus. We do have base rate information about that. We have a ton of epidemiological data for making decisions about coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, are people using that information? That remains to be seen uh, somewhat, right? And so... If the base rates and the stereotypes or diagnostic information are incompatible, that is, they conflict, then we see errors um, approaching 80%. So 80% of the time people get these things quote unquote wrong. Now, is it wrong? No. Jack could be one of the five engineers just randomly selected, but that's not what the question is. The question is what is most likely? And what is most likely has to do with base rates and base rates only, okay? But this falls into a heuristic that we have, which is called the representativeness heuristic. And so we make this error because we think that Jack seems like an engineer based on this description. And so he resembles group engineer and thus he is part of group engineer regardless of the base rate information that I have regardless of any numbers that say probabilistically this isn't the case. But because I have to set a correct answer for this, a normative answer, okay, I then set lawyer as the normative answer. And so when people choose engineer on this one, they get it, it wrong. And so that's why you see error rates from 60 to 90%. Hey, zombie. So why do people make this error? Well. So one of the descriptions that I had for my dissertation was this dual process theory argument, right? So people make this error because it's a heuristic. It utilizes what's called type one thinking, right? It's fast, automatic, super low effort. Jack looks like an engineer, sounds like an engineer, acts like an engineer. Guess what? He's an engineer, regardless of what the, the base rates say. Versus actually taking the time to think about it and using the base rate information in what would be called type 2 thinking, which is slow, controlled, high effort thinking, right? And some of the features that define type 2 thinking are things like working memory, right? How much working memory? That's the, pref that's the lateral PFC, okay? Lateral PFC, working memory. Hmm. Cognitive decoupling, being able to um, separate things. But it's also the link between type 1 and type 2. And this is where the ACC comes in. This is a looming question about how the base rate neglect problem works, as well as other heuristics that get you into trouble. 
okay, is the connection between fast automatic thinking and slow deliberate thinking, okay? And that's where that conflict detection comes in. And conflict detection is done by your ACC. So just to define conflict detection within this realm, okay, this is a mechanism, it's a cognitive mechanism, so it's a black box, right? I don't have actual neurological uh, data for its existence, okay? A physical existence, right? But it's an idea. It's a concept. Initially generated responses, type one, thinking, compared with cued information in a problem or situation, right? So the detection has to come from the mismatch between the base rates and the stereotype, okay? You need to have that. If they're the same, then there's no conflict ACC, is not active. But if there is a conflict, ACC becomes active, okay? And this is what the research suggests, okay? So the neuropsych evidence, and, and the interesting thing about the neuropsych or neurophysiological evidence is that, uh, excuse me, is that uh, it's pretty much all ERPs at this point. It's pretty much all ERPs, which is strange because we've talked about frequently that ERPs aren't very good at penetrating deep into medial portions of the brain. But because the anterior cingulate cortex is along the central hemispheric fissure, okay, you can actually pick it up by EEG because it is technically available through the scalp, as far as to be picked up. You essentially put the electrodes on the central uh, part of the skull, as far as, the, uh, as close to this mid-sagittal line as you can, and then you can pick up uh, ACC activity, because, even though it's on the medial portion of the frontal lobe, okay? So the ACC is first pinged when you see um, conflict. It's, so it's it's active in this task. It's also active on the Stroop task, which I've talked about, right? You may be familiar with the Stroop task. Um, the words and the 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 colored words, and you have to say the uh, you have to say the uh, color of the word, and or excuse me, yeah, the color of the ink, and not the word color. Don't didn't say that right. <laughs> Let me back up. So Stroop task, if you're not Familiar is um, you have to say the color of the ink of the word rather than the what the color word is. So red and blue, you'd have to say blue and not red. And so the you get conflicted about this. So ACC is active during the Stroop test. It's also active during flanker tasks, which are when things on the uh, outside of what you're supposed to be staring at are um distracting you so there's conflict there okay the simon task uh, i don't remember what the simon task is i've done it before i've had people do it and i can't remember it off the top of my head um it's good for global it, it's active during global local tasks so i showed a global local task in cog psych with s's and h's when an s is made of s's or an s is made of h's there is conflict there on what you're actually looking at. If you're looking at the S, the giant S, the global S, or you're looking at H's, the tiny little local H's that make up the S, there's conflict there. ACC is active, okay? And then go no-go tasks. So simple task where you're given an instruction that when you see certain stimuli, you hit the button. When you see another kind of uh, stimuli, you cannot hit the button. So that's no go no-go tasks. And so the ACC is active during each of these tasks, okay? Firmly established uh, in both ERP studies as well as fMRI studies. The right lateral prefrontal cortex, and you can see that the R and the L for this acronym is um, lowercase. So when you're talking about um, direct direction locations. They are lowercase, and then the uh, prefrontal cortex itself is capitalized as part of the acronym, right? So, 
the idea behind this with respect to conflict detection, conflict and cognitive control, being able to stop yourself, the right lateral prefrontal cortex, so this side of my, this side of my brain, okay, seemingly uh, part of the pre-potent response inhibitor. So I mentioned that the prefrontal cortex, uh, specifically the lateral prefrontal cortex, is responsible for that prepotent response stoppage, okay? Now, in the base rate neglect example, the prepotent response, if you have the engineer stereotype, that's the prepotent response. Whatever is generated by your fast heuristic thinking, that's the prepotent response. In the Stroop test, or Stroop task, the prepotent response is what you read the word to be. So if it's red and blue ink, the prepotent response is red. So the right lateral prefrontal cortex stops that prepotent response if that's not how you want to answer, if that's not what you're supposed to answer, okay? So, this is a really important brain area, and it seemingly only is lateralized to the right. Okay, so right lateral. So, the ANS is a good place to also gather physiological data, because um, if you are faced with a, a, a problem where you're getting all hot and bothered by it, a conflict will... Uh, Start in the ACC and then cascade down into the spinal cord and, and of course, you'll start then going into fight or flight response. And uh, there are all sorts of sympathetic body responses that you can get. You can get heart rate, you can get respiratory rate, you can get skin, conducted, skin conductance responses from those, okay? So the idea here is that there is, if there is a conflict and you feel the conflict, then you will also have autonomic nervous system um, changes, which can be measured, of course, right? All right. Um, I did, and so this is the specific ERP study on the um, ACC that I wanted to talk about. So it has to do with the N2 or the N200. Okay, the N200. Generally speaking, it's 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 and the it's called the n2 and it's this um spike here that happens in between the 200 and 300 millisecond timing so this is erp okay just to just to reiterate erp erp is the average eeg signal time locked to certain tasks so here in this particular task they were um they were um doing reasoning they were doing a reasoning task okay um and then and which classified them as poor reasoners versus good reasoners and then they did a go no go task okay so they did reasoning and then they did a go no go task okay and you can see that here in the top my n200 poor reasoners has a larger negative peak and this is statistically significant than the uh, good reasoners. It's not huge, it is statistically significant. Not huge, but I will say that what you get from this is that there is a larger spike in negative voltage. So there is more activation among poor readers in the ACC than in good reasoners, okay? So the conflict is there and the conflict is being told, yeah, hey, there's some conflict here. But here in the ERN, okay, there is no difference. So that means that the right lateral prefrontal cortex was not saying, no, you don't wanna make this prepotent response so that's why they're poor reasoners, because they're making the prepotent response, and the prepotent response is wrong, okay? So there is a difference in N2, but there is no difference in ERN, okay? 
and that's why they make poor reasoning errors or reasoning errors which makes them poor reasoners compared to good reasoners some conflict detection and then they activate that cognitive that conflict resolution which is the right lateral prefrontal cortex so we've got acc detecting the con the the conflict sending information to the right lateral prefrontal cortex like don't do that prefrontal uh, don't do that don't do that pre potent response okay Woo! that's a lot that's a lot but it's 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 fun uh it's fun stuff i mean i think it's fun obviously uh I don't know if you noticed, but I got really, really enthusiastic about it. As much as I dislike the um, research surrounding my dissertation, it was not a fun time. Writing my dissertation was the most awful thing I've ever done. Um, I got through it, which is important. And I still like talking about features of it. But boy, oh boy, do I not want to do that research ever again. <laughs> Uh, a couple of different things uh, that I wanted to point out. So switching gears, switching gears. Let me know if you have any questions about my research or that research or related email in chat. Doesn't matter. Okay. Let me know. I like talking about it. I don't like doing it. I like talking about it though. Um, so La Hermite um, studied frontal damage. So deficit wise studied frontal damage in patients, and he came up with um, the uh, term called utilization behavior. So uh, utilization behavior occurs in patients with frontal damage because what they do is they have an extreme dependency on prototypical responses for guiding their behavior as opposed to what um, neurotypical or intact brains would do in certain cases where we have to use novel information to help us where we have to use novel information to help us uh we're most people are perfectly capable of taking novel information and goal directing it okay using all of the all of the structures that i've just mentioned right prefrontal the um, lateral prefrontal cortex the medial prefrontal cortex the frontal pole and the acc we can take that information and we can use novel information, novel behaviors. However, if you have damage to the frontal cortexes, cortices, um, then you will engage in what is called utilization behavior, according to La Hermite. I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm probably not. Um, other injuries that have been noted by frontal lobe injuries, and most of these frontal lobe injuries, save for Phineas Gage, uh, have to do with stroke. Okay, lots of strokes damage the frontal areas. It's a big area, as you can see. It's massive, right? Lots of strokes, lots of surface area for strokes to occur, lots of vasculature for strokes to occur. And so you have, you have a lot of these issues, okay? So planning, we saw that in the video. Deficits to planning. Uh, perseveration, I'm going to talk about perseveration in just a second. And then disruption of, of working memory. Those are also big issues, right? So we run into trouble uh, and then you, you see these, you basically see these focal injuries in most frontal lobe uh, uh, injured folks, okay? And they're focal injuries because they th this damage doesn't actually impact other features so you could be deficit in complex planning behavior but um you'd be fine in other problem solving aspects okay you could have damage to perseverate perseveration whereas you continue to perseverate on impossible tasks or d difficult tasks but you still uh, but you have no damage to other er but you have no deficits in other cognitive areas and the same thing with working memory so these are focal injuries to that so I do want to talk about perseveration because it involves another task. Um, and I like talking about the end back task. Um, I do have a quick video of it too. Um, I think we have time for that. Yeah, we have, time. we have time for that. So perseveration. Okay. It is the noun of persevere. Okay. And you, of course, are 
wonderful human beings who are attempting to persevere through pretty crappy times right now in the age of COVID. Yep. And I hope you're all persevering through this time. Now, perseveration as a noun of persevere, okay, is the tendency to continue on a task or a particular response, even if that context has changed or the response is no longer appropriate. Uh, you can measure perseveration by giving somebody an impossible task to do that you know that there is literally no solution to the task. There are plenty of uh, impossible tasks. Um, we use, oh, what was the impossible task we used for the Gatorade study? Oh, I wish I remember. It was some sort of tracing task, I think. Some some sort of tracing. I, I don't know, remember exactly what it was. But you couldn't actually, like, draw or trace the thing. It was um, literally impossible. There was no solution. And so we measured how long somebody would spend on doing this task, and that would be perseveration, right? There's a point at which you have to give up. There's a point at which you realize that the task is impossible. You've exhausted all of your, um, you've exhausted all of your uh, cognitive energy or your solutions on solutions, on attempting it, doing the response, but none of it works, right? So that's what um, perseveration is. And you can study perseveration through a task like that or an end back task. Um, also connected to perseveration is the loss of inhibitory control. Okay, so if you have a focal injury, you might perseverate too long and you will lose the control to stop yourself. Okay, so let's talk about the end back task for a second. So I'm gonna let the, the this, what I think is a uh, psychologist telling you about the MBAC test. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but um, here's also the rapid serial presentation of what an MBAC is. Now, N stands for how many back you have to go. So if time is moving, uh, they don't actually have a time arrow. Time is moving from the K to the P, right? So from the K to the P. So a one response, uh, one back task is when you see a letter repeat, you are supposed to hit the button. So SS, that's when you have to hit the button. LL, that's when you have to hit the button. A two back task is when you hear, when you see the um, a response from two spaces back. So a K, then you see another K, but it has to be two spaces, then you respond, right? So there's a letter in between. So you can see that if I make this an eight back task, that's gonna suck, right? Because then you have to hold all of that in working memory to make sure that you have then are looking at it. So um, here's a video, uh, an additional explainer. L, E, C, E. So that's a two back task. T. T. Not an appropriate response because it's a two back task. T. See, there's there you go. I don't know why e. they didn't put it on the screen though. K. P. H. P. There you go. The task is called the N back test because N can be any number. And the higher the number, the more demanding and difficult the test becomes because the memory load increases. If you practice this N back test, starting, say, with, with one letter back, and then practice with two letters back, and then with three letters back, and so on, how many letters back do you think you could master? Do you think you'd be smarter in the sense of having more G after you mastered four or five, five letters back, assuming that you could? That was the first test. Here's the second version of the task. This is a visual spatial version. You will Which see a box somewhere on the screen. The box will be in a different spot on each trial. 
you press the button when the box appears in the same spot, but two trials back. Now this is pretty hard, and here's a demonstration. Again, we'll show the series across the top so you can see how this works. I like this guy's setup. Oh, this is not letters. Okay. I think it's going to be a two-back task, yeah. So it's a two-back task, and you have to put the orientation of the block in the right uh, area. So there you go. That would be the appropriate response. It's not the same response every time. So there's not a target. It's not the lower right or the center or the, you know, bottom right. It's just what has repeated now two places ago. That was pretty tough. But again, you get better with practice. But these researchers were not satisfied with training people to do both versions. They also trained people to do both versions simultaneously. Simultaneously? This is called the dual Incroyable. impact test. And here's what it looks like. Yes, dual impact, impact tests are sucky. E. C. There you go. E. There you go. Now. T. So this is, again, still a two back T. task, but with U. two features. T. Look at that. T and bottom D. center was both responses. K. P. H. P. You see that this is really very difficult. I mean, very difficult. Mm -hmm. But with training over several days and weeks, people improved from doing two back versions to doing three, four, and even five back versions in some cases. What? The more days of training, the better they did on the dual and back task. Yeah. So you need a combination of working memory processes and um, inhibition processes working, right? So the lateral prefrontal cortex, um, the frontal pole, the medial prefrontal cortex. We need all of these to work to tell us when to hit the button, when to not hit the button. But people who perseverate are struggle. And people who have damage to some of these areas struggle with this because maybe their working memory capacity or duration is not too um, is not too good, or they don't recognize when they need to hit it versus when they don't need to hit it. So that prepotent response inhibitor, right? So, uh, <laughs> Katarina, yeah, uh, it's it's tough, but you would get better at it if you were to train at L. it. L. Oh, sorry, L. Um, and there's further further evidence here from, I'm not going to go over all of it, um, Knight and Grabowecki uh, also determined through ERP how um, there were issues with determining right and left ear tones, uh, the auditory clicks um, of neurological patients. So the parietal region, there was no difference. The temporal parietal region, there was um, a little bit but uh, because of auditory issues in the temporal parietal region. But then the frontal lobe really showed a drastic difference between the um, lesion and control patients. They, they struggled to um, they struggled to do the task. Okay. Um, so here are the, these, the, the first one are the evoked responses and the areas of those neurological patients. Um, with damage to those areas. So the orange is, orange is, is um, lots of damage. Uh, yellow, or the focus of the, da focus of the damage, sorry, not the lots of damage. And then yellow is surrounding damage. Um, and then these are the, these, the, the these graphs to um, the right are, um, the right are to, the evoked responses in the actual specific regions, okay? 
Um, and you can see that neurologically healthy, those were the controls. That's what they should look like. And so prefrontal lesions and right and the left, you can see that they are um, inactive. Okay. So if we are talking about the attended ear or the unattended ear, they have very little activity going on in the right prefrontal regions. It's, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, but uh, we need inhibition. And um, the w last brain area that I'll talk about is the inferior prefrontal gyrus. Inferior prefrontal gyrus. Okay. Um, this is an interesting study about uh, inhibition and uh, how it connects to the motor areas. We'll talk more about the motor areas um, next Tuesday when we talk about action. Uh, but um, for a baseball player to successfully check a swing, if you are if you are uh, knowledgeable about baseball, um, you as a batter you can um, prevent the swing from going a passing the home plate, which would technically be a swing and strike if you miss the ball but if you check a swing and you don't pass home plate slash the foul line of the opposite base that you're hitting so third base if you're a left-hander first base if you are a um a right-hander uh you can you know prevent it and go i didn't want to bring that because maybe uh, the pitch was actually going to be outside of the strike zone and thus a ball and so you want to make sure that um you uh you don't swing at it otherwise it's gonna be a strike because you're gonna miss it so learning how to do this is really important for a baseball player okay and um so here you can see uh, the swing and what's active during the swing uh, a successful stop, so that would be a check swing, okay, and then a failed check swing, which goes a little bit too far, okay, and so blue line, this is the signal change, and then a successful stop versus a failed stop in the right motor cortex, so we have the right inferior frontal cortex, which is the red area, and then its connection to the premotor um, somatosensory area, Oh, it's pre, yeah, it's kind of sensor. Hmm, STN, and then um, a uh, motor group down here, STN. Um, and so you can see that the failed swing is over here, whereas the oh wait, I'm sorry, the successful stop has a lot of activation. Sorry, I was getting my um, colors mixed up. So uh, red is successful stop. Right, so I have to use all of my motor energy to stop. Oh, gosh. But in a failed swing, we go a little bit too much, and we're like, oh, crap. Oh, no. I just thought I wanted to include this because I like baseball. Anyways, um, inferior frontal gyrus slash inferior, inferior frontal cortex. Okay, important for inhibition. So again, damage to that is going to lead to an inability to um, pause motor movements, uh, inhibit motor movements. Okay. Um, so that's what we're gonna. That's where we're gonna end today. And so, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, I am. Um, I'm available for a little while longer. Otherwise, you can email me. Uh, but that will be it for today. I hope uh, everyone has a. Uh, good rest of their day.